people arriving. So we'll be starting here in a few minutes. Just a few announcements. This is the start of the day. Our panel, which is something I always look forward to, and I'm sure most of you, you do or you wouldn't be here right now. The room seems to be a little upside. <laughs> over here. All right. Next up after this event, coming up at 12.45, the Honeybee Trio. And then Alan Cass has his presentation at 2.15. Once again, the Tom Doctory Band, which you saw last night as the civilian band, performs this afternoon their tribute to the Glenn Miller Army Air Force Band at 3.30, right here. And of course, tonight, the world-famous Glenn Miller Orchestra 7.30, under the direction of Nick Hilscher. They do have a new, new for us, girl singer, and uh, always a few surprises. If you've seen the thing, if you weren't here last night, okay, first of all, how many of you were here last night? Most of you, all right. So those of you who weren't here, they're having an auction of piano keys, just two doors down here at the ticket office. A number of years ago, they had a number of our Miller celebrities autograph a long piano key. And uh, they are auctioning off four of them, and they will be up for auction until the Miller concert tomorrow evening. So if you're interested in that, just step down to the ticket office they have a silent auction form, and you can sign and, and make your bid. Uh, Paul Tanner autographed it, Steve Miller, Pat Friday, a whole bunch of other people. All right, I think we're mostly situated here, so we will begin. We have some new faces, some uh, veteran faces, and... Uh, they look like they're at the ready. First up, we had him on the panel last year, and he is the brother of Paul Tanner. Paul Tanner passed away just recently. It was like the last surviving member of the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Now I realize Ray Anthony and a few other people are around, but the man who was with the whole tenure or his tenure with the band was the run of the civilian band, Paul Tanner, trombonist. Please welcome his brother, Stu Tanner. All right, have a seat there on the end, Stu. I made it up without the cane this year. All right, first accomplishment right there. <laughs> and then, Mike Gull, have you been on the panel before? No, I haven't. All right, this is a debut. His face is familiar. He's been at many festivals over the last number of years. He is a musician in our uh, Glenn Miller Birthplace Society band that we, we play. Uh, he's a friend of Ed Polich. Many years. Many years. And you're from Chicago? Uh, yeah, some. Thereabouts. Some. All right. So welcome, Michael Delaney. <laughs> this is over there by Stu. <laughs> and we have another debut. This young man was essentially nominated by uh, Jan Everly because they are friends and acquaintances. And uh, from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, he's a writer, a presenter. He's a radio personality on WYYR. Please welcome Jeff Karpinski. We'll find out more about him and his expertise. Number of years ago, Alan Cass became the curator and the protector of the Glenn Miller Archives out in Colorado. Please welcome Alan Cass. <laughs> We're going to have to start getting 
getting an elevator for the, for the stage. Here. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, he was a contemporary of Glenn Miller and has a, had a 60 year career, actually longer than that. Once again, we are so happy he is back with us. He was with us last year after a few years' absence. Please welcome Norm Layton. <laughs> Arranger with the Glenwood Army Air Force Band. And musician for excellence. Welcome again. Okay, as soon as we get the mics on, we'll be ready to roll. Norm has even brought a horn. I work a couple of musicals in the amateur musicals. I'm in 
we'll be doing Kiss Me Kate, I guess, in August uh, for a little theater group in Chicago. And uh, let's see. Um, well, that's, that's basically it. Okay. That's it. How long have you known Ed? Oh, yeah, I should mention that. Ed and I had a little musical combo together. I don't know if anybody knew this, but Ed played accordion. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah one night we were out for breakfast and he forgot to lock the car. He came back and there were four more accordions in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, it, yeah, he played a little clarinet too, as a matter of fact. Well, Ed is brilliant. I mean, he could pick up the chair and make music out of it. You know? But, so then I go way back to the 1950s. We had a little combo with a trumpet, and uh, I played the saxophone. He played accordion. He had a sit-down amplifier, which was also a stand, you know. And uh, we were we were pretty bad. We had a, <laughs> had a drummer too. Uh, so it was just a four-piece group, and we used to play weddings and things when people weren't too particular about how the band sounded. <laughs> well, you know, all through the 40s, the important thing was the music. And their, and their cover versions were all over the place. They call them cover versions. You, know, you all understand that term, kind of? Well, but very, very quickly, during the 1940s uh, and 50s, uh, you could play uh, your version of a, a song, because the song was the important thing, you see? But then all that changed, and pretty soon you had to hear the song by the original artist, you know, all through the 70s and 80s. And uh, so that basically put the, put the nail in the coffin for jobbing musicians. But so Ed and I go way back to the at least the 50s or so now. He comes in every two weeks uh, to get uh, to the suburbs because uh, he has like four houses in the area, <laughs> and uh, the family home is still there. And he comes in and we play. Uh, we have pizza. And we play cards with a couple of widows that uh, Ed is kind of watching over. Really, All right. and, yeah. So uh, so I see him every two weeks. All right. Now for those of you who don't know, we're talking about Ed Polich. Who he doesn't like to be called it, but we call him, you know, the world's foremost Glenn Miller authority. And uh, Ed's been under the weather. His wife Judy has been under the weather, so unfortunately, they are not with us today. And uh, normally, Ed is is on our panel. Next up, our new face, Jeff Karpinski from Valley Forge. Tell us a little about yourself, Jeff. First thing, I would like a couple of people on either side of me to pinch me and wake me up. <laughs> yeah. I, one thing, I'm kind of out, I feel a little bit like I'm out of my league here, but I, I definitely want to thank Jan and Ray, perfect name, uh, for the opportunity to appear here. Uh, unlike some of the other people here, I'm not a musician. Uh, my father, brother, daughter, all excellent musicians, the genes simply went over me. So being uh, left with that, I decided, what can I do? Well, I'm going to have to write, study, talk, present, and try to carry on the flame that way if I can't do it musically myself. I, as I mentioned, I live, uh, actually the town is named King of Prussia, which most people haven't heard of. In fact, I've actually been accused of making it up. But it's a real place. Uh, it sits right on the outskirts of Valley Forge Park. Any of you who are in the Philadelphia area at some point, please stop out to the park. Uh, wonderful history. The, really the place where the nation was formed. Uh, as far as my own uh, background is concerned in my day job, I'm, I write financial software, so it's totally orthogonal to music. But uh, I grew up around the big bands. My best friend through elementary school and high school was a fellow whose father had been with Jimmy Dorsey and Charlie Barnett. And uh, I, actually he was, uh, he was in the book that The Great Escape was based on. He was a POW. And, Jazz saved his life because one of the uh, guards happened to like what the Germans called degenerate music, but he played it, degenerate music, and formed a little combo. And anyway, that's how his son got to be here because the guard spared his life, and that's how I got interested in the big bands. Uh, this fellow had a huge collection, and from that I got to know other people and just started studying and writing and presenting and did a college radio show. And ended up meeting more and more people in the business and uh, then had put things away a little bit when uh, our children were born and then everything just sort of fell back in place again now that they're, uh, they're out of the house and uh, it was just coincidence, luck and good fortune that I ended up on WYYR and uh, we have a show called Miller on Monday, Jan is every week, I'm right now only every, uh, every two months 
a little bit different, but uh, please give it a listen. And again, thanks very much for this opportunity. Nice to have you here. Next up, Alan Cass. Most of you know who he is, but for those who may not know, he's, is your official title curator? With a small c, yeah. And director, <laughs> executive director. And partially retired. And partially retired. Mostly retired. <laughs> And he is the curator of the Glenn Miller Archive at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And they've dropped the at at this point, so it's Colorado Boulder. Oh, okay. No I'm just teasing, yes. <laughs> well, that, that, they actually did that, I'm not sure for what reason, but you're right. All right. Tell everybody a little bit about the archive and maybe uh, the newest, greatest thing you got. Sure. Well, I'd like to start off by saying, how many of you were here in 1977, when uh, this whole thing began. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. She's got her hand up. Yes, we were here today. There's quite a few of us here. How about that? So it's our 38th for us, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come back here and, uh, and meet our friends. And uh, uh, Sue and I really uh, love this community. They've been so opening for all so many years. And so it's just great. It's, uh, it's like coming home for us in many ways. Yes, we started uh, the, the collection at the University of Colorado back in 1969. We had no idea what we were doing really at the time. I was an assistant director at our student union. And we had the Glen Miller Ballroom, which had been named for Glenn back in, in 1953 when the building was finished. And uh, that's when they were filming the Glen Miller story. June Allison and Jimmy Stewart spent a whole day filming on campus. You'll notice the scenes in the Glen Miller story. And uh, we, we we're aware of the fact we had a lot of students showing up in 69. We had absolutely no idea who this guy Glenn Moore was, <laughs> that he had given his life for his country, that he was an alumnus of the university, although perhaps there for maybe two semesters, his wife was an alumnus as well, graduated from the university. So I convinced our director that we put together a small display case in the corner of the ballroom so the students would understand who this guy was and how important he was in the music of this country. Little did we know at that time where it would go from there. I decided at one point, to, in order to get, get some photographs and so forth, we uh, got a hold of our alumni director and he suggested in the alumnus newspaper that we write to a, a little article about what we were doing. And uh, it was just amazing. Uh, without our knowledge, somebody from United Press International who was an alumnus picked up on the story and ran the story worldwide without our knowledge. And our surprise was two or three days later, we started, the postman started showing up with packages. It might be an, an autograph from a, a, a young lady who had seen the, the orchestra at the Cafe Rouge, and uh, she said her grandchildren <coughs> probably were not interested in something like this, and finally there's a place to put these items. So that's kind of how it all began, and it has never stopped. We continue to, it continues to grow, and it's not only at Glenn Miller, archive now. It's really big bands and it's just amazing how it's grown over the years. So that's kind of how it started. And we have a great announcement to make right now. We just recently, this last week, moved into our, our library on campus. We were in a separate building and every place that I went as an administrator, I usually found some space to put these items. But now we're, we're officially in our, our, our beautiful library and we're going to be adding to that. We're going through a fundraising right now to add four stories in, in our building. And, uh, and it's going to be extraordinary. It's all archive material. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're real pleased. We've got professional archivists, and uh, it's going great guns. So that's kind of a nutshell on, on how it all began. And we're very, very pleased. Uh, it's great to see everyone. And if anybody has anything and you're wondering, gosh, what's going to happen to this, uh, see how he'd be happy to keep it for you <laughs> forever and ever, hopefully. Well, next up, Norm Layton. Uh, if you've come here any number of times, you've seen Norm. I've been privileged to be on stage, and I'm, I'm like uh, Jeff. I can't play a note either. I always tell people I play the stereo. And uh, <laughs> to be on stage, just to be the announcer on our Glenn Miller Chesterfield show and with Norm out front, uh, it's been a privilege. And not only have I done it once or twice, we've done it about a half a dozen times. And uh, who knows? You might see him up on stage before the weekend is over. I notice you've brought your licorice stick there. 
never leave anything home without it. <laughs> so how smart these days? How are you these days? How are I? How am I? Uh, I'm 95. <laughs> Thank you. 
question, Dr. Jay. Don't be that way.
And Norm, as Sue will attest, did the most remarkable thing. He took those musicians, and if you want to know how the sound was created, we all know about the sound that Goodwill created, but Norm put it together instrument by instrument, and you can see how it just built every instrument as he played all the way through, and he had the complete sound, having the students play these. It was just extraordinary. I've never heard it done so, so well. We can talk about it verbally, but to hear the sound as he put it together, note by note, was absolutely was extraordinary. Thank you for the words. Well, all of us. He's a great man, there's no question. No, that, was, that was a lovely time that, 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 that doing that concert. Yeah. I asked Norm, we, we drove up in the Air Force Academy where he had been giving his, uh, his concert with them, and I said, now, having been with Glenn Miller in 1944, Norm, what was the, what piece of, of uh, information did, did uh, Glenn give to you as far as uh, you know, what you thought uh, you, you should know? And Glenn, and, or Norm said, well, the, 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 the best advice he's ever given to me right. was, was uh, uh, as an arranger. I have to put this in the, in the, in sure. the, in, in the, the it's where it belongs in the, in the, in the uh, and uh, I made an arrangement for Glenn uh, and uh, I thought it was a really neat arrangement uh, and, uh, and, you know, and I did a, did a lot of things in, in, in that arrangement and, 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 but it didn't seem to be the guys in the, the, the band that didn't get very excited about it <laughs> But uh, the, so Glenn, Glenn took me aside to, uh, afterwards and said, well, Norm, that was, that was a nice try, but says, it ain't what you write, it's what you don't write. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to, uh, that's what, at that, that time, I'm, if I, as an arranger now, I think, when in doubt, leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's my motto. <laughs> so, Yeah, let's go back to Stu. Yeah. Stu, uh, your brother Paul came here many times. He was nice to everybody. That's why Glenn Miller put him on the end of the trombone section to, to talk to the fans. And uh, in his passing, what do you reflect on about his life and and his affability, that he was so nice to everybody. Well, uh, there were six boys in my family, and Paul and I were the most alike in appearance, in uh, activities, in uh, uh, dealing with people. We both love working with people. I still do, and, and Paul always has, up until he, up until he passed away in February. He, uh, we, we just, we were so much alike, uh, we, we could have been twins if we'd have been born the same day. <laughs> but he's, he was uh, about eight or nine years older than me. And uh, when he was, we were born, I was born in a boys' reform school that my dad had taken over. And uh, uh, Paul used to practice a lot in his own room because he had a little problem with speech. He stammered just, just a, 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 little, a, a little bit. And uh, uh, it, uh, it was a boys' school, and if he was out playing with the other boys, some of them would make fun of, it, fun of him, not directly to his face, but off to the side, they'd be imitating him. And so he stayed in his room most of the time. The other brothers went out, and I was just, I was born there, and I, as soon as I got old enough to walk, I'd go over to the room, his room, and I'd sit there and I'd watch him practice. And he practiced all day, and he mm -hmm. would eat apples. He had a whole carton, a whole basket of apples there. And at the end of the day, my mother would go in there and clean up the whole row of apple cores on the windowsill. <laughs> he, was, he was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Because he practiced all day, he got 
very, very good at it. He had an extremely high range, extremely low range, and he had a, a, a perfect vibrato. But uh, my other brothers were also musical. Uh, all four of my, old, my four older brothers were all professional musicians. Uh, well, we had to be. My dad was a graduate of Cincinnati Conservatory. My mother, all four of my grandparents, they were all musical. And uh, it, it was a gift in our family. And, uh, and I really appreciate that gift. Uh, when I joined my brother uh, on the, at the Steel Pier in Atlantic City, uh, Glenn Miller was on the stage signing autographs on the edge of the stage. And the orchestra was still playing. And Glenn looked over at me signed some more autographs, and he looked over and he said, aren't you Paul Tanner's brother? I said, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the other kids that were all gathered around the front of the stage turned around and asked me for my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> my head, my boy. And uh, so I signed their books, and I signed Stu Tanner, Paul's brother. <laughs> Uh, people still treat me like a celebrity, and I have to keep reminding people, I'm not the celebrity, I just happen to be the brother of one. <laughs> and, and he's been a great celebrity. Uh, I was so proud and so pleased that he overcame the stammering as, while he was with Glenn. Uh, one of the reasons he got the, the name of Lightning was because he, took, he, sto he spoke very slowly because he was trying to avoid stammering. And so his speech was slow, and everything he did, he had to think twice about whatever he was doing. So he was so slow, they called him lightning. <laughs> but, but he liked it, and uh, uh, I'm so glad that he overcame that enough to teach at UCLA. For over 20 years, he taught a course there that was a, the favorite course on the campus. He had the most students. 1,500 students in his class on a three-year waiting list. He started teaching there a course in trombones because he went back to get his own degree. And while he was there, they said, well, you're a famous trombonist. How about teaching trombones? And he did that. And so many people were asking him about other musicians that he knew over the years that, that they asked him to teach a course on the history of jazz. So he, he wrote his own textbooks, which are now used all over the world. And, and he's several, he's several uh, issues of it. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, uh, he taught there for, for 30, for uh, 20, 20 some odd years, and uh, was a distinguished uh, professor there a number of times. Uh, when he passed away at UCLA, they, they a dedicated a, a service to him, flew their flag at half mast in his memory. Uh, he was he was quite popular there, and uh, I'm I'm just so pleased that I look like him. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he and I, out of the six boys, he and I were the closest buddies of the whole six. Uh, I I just I'm just so pleased, so delighted. To, to be able to represent him here. And it's, uh, it's a real honor for me to do that. Uh, thank you very much. And, and we're happy you are here and representing him. Alan, you told me a story last night, and if you could share it with us. Your last meeting with Paul in the hospital. <clears throat> Well, it was very memorable. We were there to attend Steve Miller's uh, service, uh, memorial service in La Jolla, California, and we decided to give uh, Gil Offdahl, who was a very good friend of Paul's, to come up and visit with Paul. And so uh, the Pulliches and Sue and I uh, drove up and uh, we got to see Paul, and uh, he had just finished taking a nap, and uh, we were in a little small room. And this was about a year ago. Just a year ago, right. And uh, uh, he, uh, he came out, we, we were there, and Sue approached him, and he looked like he was a little confused at who everybody was who was there. 
That's Sue leaned over and said, oh, where the gas is from the University of Colorado Boulder. And his eyes just lit up. And uh, it meant so much to us that his memory came back to him. And, uh, and it was just a very special one. We must have spent over an hour and a half. And uh, uh, Ed had brought along some, some downloads that he had made of the Ender Sisters with Glenn Miller. And they'd been cleaned up to the point you could actually hear them breathing mm. as they were singing. And uh, Paul was just enamored by that sound. And he remembers all the trombone positions while those, these, these were being played. And it was just remarkable. You know, he was in and out, obviously, uh, but at the same time, he was, he was with us and he, he understood what was happening and uh, he enjoyed listening to the music and I think he enjoyed us being there. So it was a wonderful experience for us. And it was the last time we had the opportunity to see him. I know Mr. Aoki has had that opportunity too. And, uh, you know, he was just a, he was a first class guy. About Mike, now Mike's got some memories about uh, music and, uh, and how arrangements were made and so forth. Uh, do you have any uh, comments? Yeah, very quickly, uh, wouldn't you think he'd be into music with you know, the whole family doing music? He got into electronics. <laughs> and he was telling me yesterday that uh, when he was, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine years old, he, you know, he rewired the lamp and everything, and eventually he went on to work for the Dumont. Uh, remember the Dumont television sets, the old, big old round ones at all? Uh, yeah, and uh, he went to Dumont Corporation and uh, he worked for uh, other places and he became quite a, an accomplished uh, electrical engineer, would you call that or something too, Paul? No, no. What would you call it? <laughs> no, I, uh, my uh, electronics was uh, uh, strictly uh, television work, uh, mostly repairing televisions until the doctor told me to get away from the high voltages and then I went, went to do it eventually ended up in uh, computers and uh, spent the rest of my career with computers as they developed and uh, ended up teaching computer programming to, to new, new people. So that was very rewarding to me. Uh, now I avoided the music field because I traveled with my dad's orchestra when I was little. Went to 17 schools before I finished high school. And uh, I wasn't going to, I had 12 years of musical training, and I did not go into that because of that. I did not want my children to have to travel and not have childhood <laughs> friends. I don't have any. My daughter up there has childhood friends because we lived in the same house for 43 years. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I like I liked what I did training computer programmers because I was helping these younger guys with their careers. But, uh, come on with your... Well, yeah, I found that fascinating. You know, you think of the whole family of musicians, you would <laughs> know, but the other direction, you know. And, and I guess it became pretty darn good at it, too. Uh, uh, I'd done a lot of amateur arranging because I was a band director for 27 years. And uh, when I was coming up, there wasn't much for the little munchkins to play. You know, much of it was too advanced. So I started uh, taking public domain stuff, you know, duets and trios and quartets, and writing up for, for the flutes and for clarinets and things like that too. And uh, I uh, eventually, as a band director, uh, I got a chance to, you know, I did band music and arrangements, and then I had a little nine-piece group. And uh, one thing that's never been talked about here is, is, is how an arranger goes about putting the notes on the paper. I mean, this does not just come, you know, like manna from heaven. But, and so I talked to Norm a little bit about his uh, uh, techniques, how he does it, you know. Uh, and the, the reason I got into that is because I played a couple community bands and we played an arrangement of Oliver, the hmm. musical, which is currently playing in Chicago suburbs. And uh, here was this arranged by Norm Layton, you know. Really? I wonder if it's the same guy, you know. And it was. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you... Uh, to get involved in doing that particular arrangement, you know. I said, was it an agent? He said, no, right? Didn't, an agent didn't book you. And I said, well, did the composer, uh, you know, no, uh, did, well, did somebody, you know. He said, no, he just sort of, he sort of liked the music. And so he sat down. And when arrangers arrange, they have what they call score paper. And you have, uh, usually on the top, you have your saxophones, your four, four or five saxophones, and you have your brass, trumpets, trombones. And then you'll have your uh, strings, maybe you'll have your, your violins, violins, strings there, and you'll have percussion down the bottom, you know. And it's, it's blank paper, and these are large sheets, 
and you'll have many of them. And uh, uh, you, you have to, you know, listen to the music, you listen to the vocal, right? And you get your, you get your inspiration from that. Plus he's a piano player too, you can believe. But many times they'll come to him and they'll say, here's, the, here's a melody and here's some chords and some words, you know, sc score it for you know a full orchestra, score it for you know like sixteen pieces, score it for forty pieces, you know. And how do you start, you know, like that? Do you start with uh, usually uh, laying out the, the whole cheer chart with a melody or something at first? Yeah. Who's going to do the melody? You always have to decide which which ones to take the melody and uh, which ones to take the just the supporting. Uh, do you go through the whole chart and lay out the, the melody, uh, and go for, or do you just kind of take it section by section? Yeah. I mean, do you, yeah. Which way? <laughs> <laughs> when you write a chart, when you write an arrangement? You have to sit down to the side and then watch. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't, you're not going to give away any secrets. Huh? <laughs> It's going to cost me, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just say what I do, and then you can, you, you know, he's not basically not going to give any secrets away. But that's what I would do. I would do the, the, lay the melody out, who's going to take it from section to section, you know, there's going to be sax or brass, you know, and go through the whole chart and get a framework, you see. And then maybe you go in and do the counter melody, uh, the, with that, you know, while the melody's taking the, holding the thing for four bars, maybe another section will do something, you know, like that. And, and then you eventually, uh, you, uh, uh, you've got your melody, your counter melody going there. And then uh, you, the last thing you really you do is, you, you, the drum part is usually the last part because that's the part that, once you've got it all finished, you say, well, what, how can the drum enhance all this? And then you go through it and, and score out the drum things. Cue the drummer in on what's happening on the chart too, you know. And then, of course, strings have been added, how the strings can fill in, you know. And basically, that's how you kind of write a chart. Uh, uh, and, uh, but he won't give away his secrets. Uh, so, so I'm just giving you an idea how, how I do it, how most arrangers do it too. And then you fill in the harmonies. You know. And you may use the harmonies that they give you, or you may come up with other creative harmonies too. But that's basically uh, at least how I do it, because obviously he's not going to give away his secrets. You know. Jeff, you do presentations and you appear to be a baby, baby boomer, like mm -hmm. myself. Yes. So uh, you never heard Glenn Miller, like I never heard Glenn Miller. But we've listened to the records again and again. And what do you get out of listening to those old radio programs? And, and uh, as a fan, what what does it present to you? Well, actually, it's, it's I'm at the risk of sounding like a seventh grade SI on what Glenn Miller means to me or something like that. Uh, I guess I'm taking it kind of from a perspective, a little bit like Stu, when we were introduced yesterday, and it was uh, almost like a long lost brother. Uh, I didn't know you had a seventh brother in there because we both started out very similarly. Uh, I started out in, uh, in the sciences. Uh, there was something that just talked to me in the same way and uh, ended up eventually in computers and talking computer programming. And I guess what I get out of it is the the sense of mathematical order and the, the sense of almost kind of perfection that Glenn had. And he was a mathematical composer because he studied with Joseph Schillinger, who taught mathematical composition. So there is that linkage between the two of them. And I, I did at one point take some composition theory and saw the underlying mathematics in it. But at a different level, I think what, what I hear culturally is the kind of excitement, the fact that this was not just four people banging away at a guitar on stage, popping up and down and making a lot of racket and relying on amplifiers and so forth. Uh, whatever, yeah. This is, these are people who were very, very deeply talented and very serious musicians who both could work together as an ensemble and work independently as soloists. And hearing what the arrangers do to bring that together and give them that kind of controlled freedom, if you speaks to me very much as, uh, well, to explain, in, in a former career, I was a math, math professor, a physics professor. So I do have that teaching gene in me somewhere. Same as you, I taught programming, I taught computer languages. And there's something in the same approach that I tried to take that 
I think I've learned from Glenn, and I, I feel I, I've studied him, listened to him long enough. I, I, I feel a little bit strange using his first name, but I feel almost as if I know the man, even secondarily. And one of the things about teaching that he seemed to do, and he was a he was a published author. He wrote a textbook. There was a copy of it here. It's uh, another method of musical composition. I don't know how many people know that. Uh, probably, I think in this room, it's probably about quadruple the number of people who are aware that he's a published author now. But uh, as a teacher, former teacher myself, uh, one of the things I looked to that he did was that he wasn't miles out ahead in front of everybody. He told people not what they wanted now, not what they wanted to hear in five years, but what they wanted next. And it was just enough to get their appetites ready for what he was going to do. And if you listen to the evolution of the band in just seven short years, going from in, in a little Spanish town in Solo Huff to the arrangements that Norm and Jerry Gray and everyone else did, and just what that band sounded like, after only seven years of evolution through the first failed band, the Sicilian and the Air Force band, that, that really speaks to me because it shows what you can do through a natural progression. And the, the other thing, as someone in the sciences that really impressed me was an interview I uh, heard with Ray McKinley. And this was, I guess I was probably about 15 or 16 at the time. And he said, uh, I'll see if I can remember exactly what he said, that sometimes some of the guys in the band didn't understand why we would have to go over one phrase dozens, maybe even hundreds of times until it was right. <laughs> until the night of the performance, when instead of just simply listening or dancing, everyone formed a huge half moon around the bandstand because they couldn't get enough of the Miller sound. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that to me, is, is a goal. I don't know if I've ever achieved it, but it's that more than anything else is what I get out of it, is that sense of doing it right. Questions? Do people have some questions? And I will come to you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Chan Everly has a question. Yeah. Yes, Chan? I do. Jeff, in your radio program, you have the opportunity to present some fantastic music. But because you do a two hour live show with call ins, you have an opportunity to open a door that a lot of us don't. What kind of questions do people call in and talk about? What do they want to know that you know as, as the historian of the things that you know? Actually, I, the way we set the show up recently, we really have not tried the call-ins. We had tried the call-in earlier, and it didn't work as well as we expected. I mean, we were getting everything from people who knew as much as Chris Valenti, who was the producer, and I put together times two. Uh, there was one fellow who was, we welcomed him, but we also had to do a lot of screening, and it just really reached the point where we decided, okay, well, what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll choose a theme for each show. Uh, it would last time because we were right in between D-Day and Memorial Day, we chose the theme of Glenn Miller Patriot, and we played all of the patriotic, not all of, but a, a good selection of patriotic recordings. But uh, rather than, than trying to wait for questions, what I guess I'm trying to do is push beyond in the boots area and blue and so forth and go to the next level and mine more of the depth and breadth of the orchestra. And in that way, maybe anticipate some questions rather than answer specific ones. Anybody else? Yes, Tom. Um, yes. Thank you. I would like to uh, ask each of you, uh, what are the top two or three tunes, Glenn Miller tunes, that you are personal favorites, and or the arrangements, and what would be uh, the top two or three arrangements uh, that are special to you, and maybe a reason or two for that? Well, I'm on the end of the line, I guess I'm first. <laughs> uh, my favorite, I just told my daughter about this, the orchestra played Adios here, and I told her, that's what I want at my memorial service. Because that, that, that's my Adios 
to my friends. Uh, there are a number of, of tunes that, that my family loved. My mother particularly liked String of Pearls. Uh, I, don't, I don't know which one Paul liked a lot, uh, the most. Probably uh, In the Mood, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, a Sunrise Serenade, Moonlight Serenade. He, I think he liked all of it. Paul was a real lover of the Glenn Miller music and the Glenn Miller style. That was that was that fitted my brother to a T. So that's my answer. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, rather than uh, I'll speak a little more in general, so that everybody else can get specifics. Uh, there's a trend these days for skilled musicians, young musicians, uh, to be told to write original compositions, you know. And most of them just kind of start here and go there. You know, the, the classic composers had little sketchbooks and notebooks when they'd get a theme or an idea, they would write it, you know, and then after a while they'd say, oh, this would make a, you know, three movements of a symphony or this would make, you know. But they, they kept uh, these uh, sketchbooks, you know. But the kids nowadays are unfortunately being taught to just, you're a composer. And I've always felt that, uh, that uh, a really gifted composer, it, it's, it, it's, it's a gift from, from the Lord, you know. It's a God-given gift to be able to write a really unique arrangement. And I think the Glenn Miller book and the Tommy Dorsey book and the, you know, the, the Charlie Barnett book are full of arrangements that have a certain thing about melodically and harmonically that they stick with generation after generation after generation. Whereas other, many other arrangements just, you know, they were serviceable, you know, they, 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 they felt for the time, you know. And uh, so that's what's happening now. Uh, I have a theory that the American popular song basically uh, died. I didn't know you knew it. To have died about the middle 1980s. If you go back to Billboard magazine and you start looking at the top 100, uh, by the middle 1980s, there's there's nothing there that's recognizable. You know, I mean the kids nowadays know the lyrics of all the songs, but they they don't last long at all. You know, and they don't have the right combination of a, a catchy melody and, and interesting chord changes or interesting rhythms that the really top arrangers, you know, the Henry Mancini's or the um, uh, Bill Finnegan or Eddie Sauter or Jerry Gray in particular, they had that God-given gift where they could really create melody and harmony that stick with you, you know. Uh, and, and that's what's lacking today in, in music as I see it now, you know. Uh, they, they're just, there's, there's none of that there, you know, at all. And that's what bothers me. And uh, Norm, on that interview that uh, Ed did with you, Norm expresses the same feeling too, that we're kind of the last of a generation of people that really knew how to write. You know, uh, you know the Cole Porters and the uh, uh, Richard Rogers, you know, and then the Jerome Kearns, that there is nobody out there. Once in a while, a tune will come out of a musical, you know, maybe a, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Sondheim, who doesn't write popular songs, he says, I don't write popular songs, but once in a while, one will creep out of a musical, accidentally. Even <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber has actually <laughs> contributed a few songs, I think, that'll be around for a long time, too, you know. But as I say, to me, it's a God-given gift to be able to sense that, you know. Why do we listen to Mozart and not Silieri anymore? Silieri was much more popular than Mozart's time, you know dedicated Christian, dedicated to the service. And Mozart hung around the taverns and the bars. And, yeah, and, and he heard the, the folk songs that had been around for 50 years, 100 years, you know. And he, he developed this kind of a sense of, of melody and, and harmony and work. And so when Mozart wrote, he wrote with that extra gift, you see. And that's why we, we hear Mozart, you know, we don't hear Solieri anymore, you know. If you saw the movie Amadeus, it was a very good uh, depiction of that. So I'll just add that, uh, that, that, that's the problem I'm seeing with all the stuff that's being cranked out today. It's all out of the same sausage grinder. Can I add anything to that? Anyway, well, for picking songs, uh, Norm, you don't have to listen because I've already told you this when I interviewed you a couple of years ago, but Barna, my favorite recording is Norm's arrangement 
uh, long ago and far away. Yes. If, I were, if someone were asked to ask me to, what song distills the Miller sound, it would be that. It has the reed blend, it has the strings, not just sitting separately, but blended with the dance band, and it has that full richness that not any of the other strong bands, not Harry James, not Tommy Dorsey, could come anywhere near. And so, I, I mean, I can go into several dozen other favorite songs, but nor for that one, I uh, don't have my hat with me, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an arrangement uh, uh, that one important and for my, my, my career, because uh, 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 we have a recording of, of one of the, Series that we had. I stand the wings. I stand the wings. Yeah, and uh, the reason I like it is that, that uh, after they, they, when they start off, and then and it gets on, then they then 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 announced that they have. What was their song? I hear you scream, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this wild, wild Jerry Gray uh, uh, swinger. And right at the end of that, it comes out, yeah, and the big applause at the end of it. And then and over that, Glenn says, you know, here's Norm Martin's arrangement of <laughs> Glenn. Uh, of, of, Long ago and far away, and this, of course, the song that you will be hearing a lot of uh, this. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I was just, oh, my goodness, he put my name on this on the radio. <laughs> and so that, that's, 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 that, this is a very fond moment for me. I have, I, I have an MP3 of that, and it is among my most treasured yeah. pieces. Yeah. 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 yeah, I, I did it. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a, this uh, whole program of the arrangers work right up here and talking about some of the little, I think, the, uh, the moments and, and Glenn's interest in the music and the harmonies of Maurice Ravel. Uh, you know, it, 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 I could, it could show how that how was, well, uh, that's, that, there was one there that, uh, Ravel wrote into a, one of his smaller works, and uh, uh, but like that, and and Glenn started using those little things like that, just that and it. Uh, Well, the, the, the first one it was "Sailor to the Star Wars." Yeah, yeah. You know the whole introduction. And, 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 he, and he would just put, uh, put little pieces of that in there. To, 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 so, so, so he went to, went to the good sources to, to steal. Yeah, yeah. 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 He invented some chords that I never knew. Alan, you got some favorites? Well, I'll tell you, that's one of the most difficult questions, Tom, that a person can ask. You take a, you take a, a poll of everyone in here, we've all got our favorite tunes. There's no question about it, and they're numerous. Like for me, it's, it's certainly that case. And, uh, 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 Serenade and Blue is one of my favorites, uh, personal. But uh, I also, well, I'm gonna throw something out to you that you're not gonna believe. You ever heard of the tune Boulder Buff? Yeah. Well, Eugene Novello, I had a chance to meet him. Uh, he was a student at CU for only one semester, took every possible arranging course and composition course that he could take. His father owned a construction business in New Jersey and allowed him to come wherever he wanted to go in the country. He'd pay for his tuition. For some reason, he picked Boulder, Colorado. I think it's because it's probably as far away from New Jersey as you could get. And uh, so he came to us one day and told us this story of how it all came about. And the fact that he took it in as a song plunder, he was encouraged to do so. And after rehearsal, Glenn invited him to play the tune. 
uh, I gave them the music and uh, they played the tune and Glenn said, you know, this is great, would you mind if I let one of my arrangers work with you on this? And it was a lasting collaboration from them at that point on. So, because of my ties with the university, that was a very special moment. And he dedicated on the radio. We've got a lot of those dedications that Glenn made to, the book, to, to my friends back home in Boulder or whatever, and the kids up on the hill, and that sort of thing, so it was very special. But Sue, what's your favorite? Let me ask her, because we have so many favorites, we just say, what do you say, so what's your favorite? Perfidia. Perfidia, yes. <laughs> so it never ends, and that's the neat thing about, uh, about Glenn and his music. I mean, it's just, uh, it's such a treasure trove of wonderful, wonderful tunes, and it has the whole gamut. So uh, it's, uh, it's all personal favorites. How about you, Kerry? Yeah, uh, you know, I have a radio show every Sunday afternoon, kcck.org out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's called Big Band Memories. I didn't select that title. I was given to me. So every Sunday afternoon, I get to play my collection on the radio. Well, I started when I was about 13, and um, RCA put out all those LPs over the years. The one radio air check where they play songs from uh, Old Man River, that show them. And every time I hear Old Man River, and they just get into that, still today. And any version of Running Wild, <laughs> especially on that uh, Glenn Miller Andrews sister set, and they start playing, and Glenn yells out, They're Running Wild! <laughs> So I like the, the toe tappers, no offense to Jan and her father Ray, but uh, I like the toe tappers, always have, the killer dillers as they say. And then when you get right down to it, all of it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions out there? Somebody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like all the songs that were associated with the war years. Dear Mom, Knit one, knit two, American Patrol, uh, Keep Them Flying. They were the favorites, and they were they uh, reflected the mood of the country at the time. Yeah. And Glenn was able to pick that up, and those songs actually took place in the lives of many young men and women who were in the service. They had wonderful songs, and, uh, and they, they spoke the country and, and the music, the country's mood. Put in Glenn Miller's movie. Oh, yeah, and that's been handed down you know, to this day. Incidentally, tonight, or actually later this afternoon, uh, Mr. Doherty and his band will be doing the Air Force, Army Air Force concert. So you'll probably hear a lot of those this afternoon. Well, Sue. <laughs> We have a Star Spangled Radio Hour. It, it's streamed worldwide through KEZW in Denver, Colorado. Rick Crandall has had this program for many years, and it's, it is the most listened to adult station worldwide, as a matter of fact, on all the, uh, the reviews that they do. Yes, programs. Programs. Yes, Star Spangled Radio, most listened to adult. Most listened to, if you can imagine that. Street, and we have listeners all over the world. And the response we get is just absolutely incredible. It's one of the best things that we uh, aligned ourselves with at the time. And we've been able to play a lot of this music that's only been recorded, was only recorded once, a lot of never before heard other than maybe once before. And uh, these are radio transcriptions, and so we're kind of making them available for people to hear. So we would encourage you to, uh, to go on our website for uh, uh, the Glenn Miller uh, uh, programs that we have and it's just uh, it's something I think you would all enjoy hearing a lot of these radio programs that you will not be able to hear anywhere else probably and uh, so it's uh, we would encourage you to do so and it airs at a specific time but it's always available yes Saturday evenings at uh, five to six our time in the mountain time zone but it's a screen it's a new screen so you because that's the, uh, uh, the uh, air staff.
tell Rick Crackle to stop talking into the programs and before they're over? Oh, okay. All right, we'll pass that along to Rick. That's a disc jockey problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I try not to do that because I know people like to hear the music. Uh, when, I, when I was a young kid, if I can interject here, uh, I lived in Wilmington, Delaware. We listened to a station out of New York. And the, uh, it was a, a musical program. They were playing, playing a lot of records and things. And uh, the guy was talking an awful lot during the music. And one of my brothers called up the station and asked him if he would just please shut up when he's playing the music. <laughs> <laughs> the announcer came back on. And over the air, he said, wash out your ears. <laughs> you, ma'am? I have a couple of CD recordings of Bing Crosby radio shows. Have you ever thought about putting these out on CDs for people like me who would like to have them? It has to do with all sorts of legal difficulties, right? <laughs> Uh, very true, and, and these guys know that to uh, do radio programs, I'm sure, uh, because you have family issues. Uh, a lot of the families still have uh, have those rights, royalty rights, and so forth. So it's it's a it's a delicate balance right now. As you know, it's very easy to download material, and uh, but you but these are intellectual properties, not only of the artists but obviously their families as well. So it's one of those things. I know Steve Miller and I have talked about this on many occasions. How difficult it was for him because. He wants the music to be heard, obviously. But at the same time, uh, the pirating issue that took place during the 50s and a lot of sharing of information and music along those lines diluted the product, obviously, that the families were due. And, uh, and so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very carefully uh, handled situation. And maybe you guys could speak a little bit to that as well. How do you handle it when people want to hear this music? And I'll just add the, the opposite spectrum was a fellow like Jack Benny. You know, Benjamin Kabelski, okay? And when Jack died, you know, they say, well, Jack, do you want to, you know, syndicate your stuff? He says, look, he says, we all made a good living out of it. He says, you know, but Dennis Day had his own show, Phil Harris had his own show, Don Wilson was on all kinds of announcing things. He says, look, we all, we all made a good living, we all had a wonderful time, just enjoy it. And he never sewed up, you know, any of the Jack Benny shows, and that's you know, and that that's how Jack was. Sure. There was never a dark side of his career at all. And Jack says, just everybody enjoy it, and just let the stuff flow out there, you know. In fact, Jack Benny, UCLA has his collection of shows, and what is today the 13th? I think it's next Tuesday. They're releasing shows that haven't been seen in 50 or 60 years, television shows, uh, Shout Factory is putting it yes. out. So if you're a Jack Benny TV fan, there is some stuff coming out about that. Uh, I, I, want, I have another angle on that. Uh, my brother, Slim Homer, but he always went by Slim, uh, was a bass player, but he also worked for a co company called Custom Music. They package music for businesses and stores and <coughs> doctor's offices and this sort of thing. And he has to keep a real tight, uh, tight hold on the uh, uh, contracts to play that music. Uh, it worked, uh, I developed, they, they were using a card system. I developed the computer system for them to, to be able to, to go in and, and search out the contracts that were expiring so that they could renew them if there was if there was much demand for the music. The music had to, uh, he had to design music for the different holidays, for Christmas packages, and uh, all the different uh, things that come up. And uh, he had one heck of a time keeping track uh, until I got that computer system in for him. And they uh, uh, had to watch that they didn't go over the, any of the contracts, because they could, they become a lawsuit for them. So they have to be careful with that. One further comment, too, as far as archives are concerned, I know our dean is, is, has said from the very beginning, we want to make this music available to everyone. And uh, that, that's our goal. And that's why this, this program has become so popular, I think, is the fact that you're able to hear these things. And when it comes to a university like this, it's a little bit different situation. 
and it was with the idea that it is, it should be available, just like Jack Benny said. And, and we have a very limited audience, let's face it. But we, if we're going to have this succeed in the future, we have to have young people listening to these as well, because that's, that's what's going to continue. So that's very important. And that's our goal, is to make sure that we make as much available as we possibly can. With the, with the approval, of course, of the family. And the families, I think, are, are in favor of this in many ways as well, because they know that they're not going to make money on some of this anymore. But uh, it's, it's a great tribute to the people who created the music, obviously. And if you go to Amazon.com and type in Glenn Miller, there's probably all sorts of things hmm. that you haven't seen that is out there. Anybody else? I didn't see you when I was out there. Just speak amongst yourselves there. Hold it, where's the link? And by the way, those the, the music programs we're talking about on the Star Spangled Hour are available. We've got an archive of them, as, uh, as most of you know who, who subscribe to this. It's free. You can go back and play these shows over and over again and listen to it and enjoy it. All right. I want to tell you a story. My son was did the sound checks at Roosevelt High School in Des Moines. <clears throat> yeah. And they were all weaned on Glenn Miller music. So he got up there one day to check the sound, and instead of saying, check, 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 he said, K-A-L-A-M-A-C-O-O. -O. And the rest of the kids looked at him and he said, Scott, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> they had never heard of Glenn Miller. But like I said, my children were weaned on it. All right. Some people are in the mood and in the know. All right, so another hand down here. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to have Norm uh, de <coughs> describe how it felt to be over in England and be playing for these guys who are maybe not going to come back anymore, listening to music this, in the, these hangars, and uh, it must have been just exciting, it must have been a thrill. While they're talking, you know, they mentioned that, that video, that one hour video that's over there, he talks a lot about uh, this, that kind of stuff. So, by all means, to see that video that's over there in the library, and he can give you much more detail on how it felt and how they avoided the bombs, the buzz bombs would come in. He tells stories about that, too. Uh, it's really a great interview with Ed Bullich. And that'll answer a lot of your questions. <laughs> Norm, they wanted to know your reaction when you're playing for the troops over there uh, in the hangars and the excitement, and how did you feel? Well, I was just glad to be with this band. They were so good. And, and, uh, 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 how did you meet Captain Miller? Uh, 
sudden one one morning, and, and we, we heard the rumors that, that, that Glenn Miller was giving up his band and, and wanted to start something else. And uh, so uh, all of a sudden one day, in and walk it's Glenn Miller and and to our uh, uh, front door of our hotel and uh, and uh, I, I was at that time the master sergeant of the rooms of ranking non com and so I says uh, Captain Miller Sergeant Layton said well get your guys together uh, we're going to rehearse. And, and, and so we knew that, that, that he was he was going to fall, fall, go through with his plan to 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 uh, to, 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 you know, to put together a real, real terrific orchestra. And so you really were at the right place at the right time. And absolutely, yeah, that's a, that, it, it was so it's such a, it's amazing. I mean, just, well, that's a, a we. Because I was I was playing saxophone in the second in, in the our hundred and second infantry band, uh, and uh, he um, and Glenn had brought the law of music, and we, we sat down with our, our own guys and and played uh, some of those charts. I remember the, the one that uh, was Robert Jerome Kern. So never mind what was it. <laughs> Catch your guys together. So he, he would rehearse us, and I was a thrill about myself. This is just, just, just this is, you know, he, he knew what he was doing, and, and it was just, this is just a thrill to just, just, just to be in his, so close to him and see how he operated. And, uh, and uh, toward the end of the, that session, he was going to, we knew he was going to go back up where he came to the, from, up to, from the, uh, the north, northern. Northern place, and uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, he oh, on the way out, I, I, I had been, been, you know, playing and, 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 and uh, long, long ago, no, not uh, uh, although the, the thing he said that I've been stuck in my mind, <laughs> he said on the way out after the end of the rehearsal, he said. Well, Norm, you don't play bad clarinet, not bad saxophone for, for, for a Yale man. <laughs> <laughs> and I would remember that little sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then you got the call. Did yep. be the yeah. You got the call to be in there. No, there was a lot of things that they moved us around in, in different places. And, and, <clears throat> One of them, we moved our little band to, 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 to a place in, in the Carolinas. And they, they brought in a lot of drafting guys that were in draft. And so, well, this, this younger guy, young guy came in with, and he said, what do you play? So I played the play flute. And, and, and uh, on the little piano. It turned out to be it was Henry Mancini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and so he was he was a member of our outfit for a while. And and, and another thing, when 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 Glenn went back up, he called me from called me and and uh, uh, from New York down to I was still in, in uh, on the on the boardwalk and uh, and, and he said, said to Sergeant, said, Sergeant Norm says, I got, got a job for you. And I said, oh. oh. <laughs> and he says, well, the, the, the <clears throat> Army Air Corps is putting on a show in, in Broadway, mostly in October, and, and it's, it's, going to, it's going to be a real big deal. And, uh, uh, and we, uh, what, what you have been, how oh, you'll be concerned, you, you need to, we need to, to, to find the best players to play in the pit bands for this show. And 
David Rose is in New York, in Hollywood, and, he, and he, he's going to come over and, and uh, write, write the overture and some uh, the music to go with the show. It wasn't a you know Broadway show. It was it was a play, the music, and and, and uh, <coughs> it's a, and your job would be to help to select help to select the the the, the, the and for the for the for the pit band, there was about 45, 45 players, and it, it would turn out to be uh, they were all you know, people who died of tests, in the symphony orchestras, they were very good. And, and he said, David is kind, and he says, and then uh, uh, he still he, he said, after the first week, uh, uh, he'll take over. What me? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and it, was, it was just he just jumped this 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 job, and, and, it, and it was it was a terrific it, six months of uh, um, <laughs> making music. I loved it particularly. It was the, the start of the show, you know, to show uh, uh, the, the, the house lights came down. Every every day at eight o'clock, the, 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 we were all in the in the pit there, or in the, and uh, they throw, turn the lights down and, and wait out until it's absolutely black, and then it's so quiet, and and, and, he, and, they, and you hear away from the distance this, this roar of flames coming. Getting louder and louder and louder and louder, and then the, the fellows, the, the, the technical guys, the, and the stage crew, of some just got together, their phone there, and I'm the phones in there. Just as a hit it, so I just, you know, and said, so I'm out there and I, and I just like, bum ba da, ba ba ba. It was a great, a magic moment, I tell you. And then go right into the, the, the overture. <laughs> yeah. He said yes.
a great interview, by the way, by Ed Pullman. So you're welcome to stop by and hear this wonderful interview with him. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to see what the, the young Sergeant Lake looks like, the 2013 Blood Miller calendar, which they're selling out the lobby, that's a picture of him. Dark hair. You were good looking. But. <laughs> <laughs> and still are. All right. All good things must come to an end. So we have to, I think, kind of start wrapping things up here. So, there we go. Well, <laughs> 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 so on the panel to have our official conclusion here. Just a few thoughts from each one of you fellows of uh, what Glenn Miller, with this organization, just any thoughts of how you're feeling about it all today? Uh, well, I, I thoroughly enjoy being here and uh, uh, meeting all the, the other people that love the Miller music almost as much as I do. Uh, I play Miller all the time at home. Uh, and you should see me march through the house when he plays the St. Louis Blues March. <laughs> I just can't sit still. Uh, I've never been able to sit still when good music is playing, especially the Miller music. Uh, I was weaned on it. It's, it's uh, just part of, my, part of my body. And uh, uh, I'm sure that a lot of people out there feel the same way. And I want you to know I'm with you. <laughs> As a young boy, about uh, I was a young boy about that. <laughs> and I was seven or eight years old, and I, I remember this. I had the I had the end of mood, uh, seventy eight RPM, you know, and we had a phonograph with a very heavy tone arm. So after the first you know hundred playings, you know, it was <laughs> that's all you heard, you know, and uh, I, I would put that thing on, and I would just march around the hassock, you know, you know. I was kind of, you know, it, would just, it just became a part of me there, you know. And uh, it wasn't until they cleaned up the recordings, you know, and got digitally, that I began to hear the cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> the third quiet course, you hear dink, 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 dink. Both did a lot of the drums. It all part of it, but they didn't play it that way last night. Nobody plays that. And so uh, when uh, the Glenn Miller band was here last year, the, the little black drummer who was, and I, I went up, I almost chewed him out, and the poor kid was, you know, he said, we didn't play the cowbell. He said, what cowbell is that? You know, so I don't know if Bo made that up or if it's in the chart. I don't really know. And so when I heard the Miller band, then again, a crew was a few months later, I had bought a cowbell. And I presented the cowbell to him. And, uh, I have pictures of me presenting the cowbell to him, you know. And, and I'm surprised, so I'm going to have to go up to uh, Doherty here and, and, and talk to his drummer. Because you, I have the cowbell in there. <laughs> yeah, the cowbell. You know, Paul, Paul talks about cowbell. that in his book. In one of his books, tells the cowbells. Is it written or was it? Yeah. Written? No. yeah it's it's in, in the chart. Book. Well, I don't know if it's in the chart. But That's what we got to find out. Okay. Jeff? Well, uh, uh, like everyone else, I, I'm just overwhelmed by the level of, of interest and the number of people. I just how unbelievably nice and forthcoming everyone has been. I'm obviously not a newbie to the Miller Sound or anything, but certainly a newbie to the, the festival. And I, I think it's also really important, I, I know with my own children, I, I successfully in one case, uh, unsuccessfully in the other, tried to interest them in uh, continuing an interest in the Miller Sound. And I think it's really important for us because we're coming to the, the end of the era of the originals. And those of us who are kind of the second and third generation now have to carry on. So I think it's really important for all of us to do what we can to make sure that 100 or 200 years from now, just as Mozart is still listened to, that Gun Miller is still listened to.
took the cutting of Ed Pollock's the other day, um, or last year actually, he was in, and he's talking about this, this particular activity. And, uh, and I was caught on the phone, and, it, uh, and it, the conversation was all, all it was, uh, you got the, the, the panel, the panel set up, they said, just uh, you're with the panel. I said, who's, who's going to be it? And then there was silence. <laughs> and then, you!